Rhys, very glad to be outdoors again, uh, enjoying some absolutely crisp, sunny winter, very nice day indeed kind of vibe here in Vasiliki right now. Absolutely no wind at all. Uh, great fishing conditions, I should think, or perhaps a bit of uh, swimming or otherwise on the water. Maybe jet skiing, uh, wakeboarding, water skiing, uh, balloon, uh, hot air ballooning, maybe a bit of getting towed behind a speedboat on a 25 foot inflatable sausage. Anything like that is looking good right now out there on the water. But right now here in the winter boat parking facility, uh, we're here for some question and answer. I'm here, questions and answers. Uh, there'll be more than one, I'm sure. Um, here with uh, Hobie 16 that I've just washed. And I think you'll find this boat is looking much nicer now. Hi, Europe Sailing. Nice to have you on board. Hi, Timon. T Typish Timon. Good to have you on board as always. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody who's tuning in right now. It's always nice to feel that I'm not just talking to myself, except uh, that is kind of what I'm doing. Hi, Steve-O. Yo, yo, yo. Good to have you back. It's been a while. Um, but we're representing the FX1 today with an FX1 cover on a Hobie 16. And yes, it does fit. And no, it doesn't fit very well. But yes, it fits enough to do the job. The job uh, that we're talking about with a cover, especially if you're leaving the boat for a fair bit without it being used, is keeping the sun off everything. Hi, <laughs> Russell. Um, need sunglasses because the shine on the 16 looks so clean. I know that is a sparkly boat right there. Um, I'm very pleased with the results this toilet cleaner gets every time on the boats. Um, and thanks to everybody who has been commenting on that video with uh, suggestions of what products you use. Of course, the different products are kind of specific to which country you're in. So if, um, uh, let's say you're in Canada, just throwing it out there, um, if there's a product that you use in Canada, then do write on your comment, I'm in Canada this is what I use. So other Canadians might think, aha, I'm in Canada and uh, I could get the same thing. There we go. All right, scrolling back already. If somebody could just let me know if my microphone's working or if you're getting the banging noise, uh, it's just good to know. I tried even harder this week with the microphone, which is why I'm going out a little bit late. Work gets in the way sometimes. Oh, yeah, sorry, Steve. I know... Um, must be a bind hi miguel thanks very much for your support all right so typish timon says which is which is the best f17 cat for you now the formula 17 class is not a class that gets talked about very much as far as i know there was only ever two boats built specifically for the Formula 17 class, one of which was our dear friend, the FX1, and the other was the Inter 17 from NACRA. Um, and because all of my experience and time in this class has been with the FX1, I'd have to say the FX1 is killing it. Also, I would say that even now, I think the FX1 came out, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was 2001 when the FX1 first came out. Um, even now, the hull shape and everything about the FX1 still looks fairly modern, whereas the um, Inter 18, if you look at one, uh, sorry, the Inter 17 does look a bit dated now with its hull shape because they went for the big chunky bows, whereas the FX1's got the more modern wave piercers, which pretty much is that everything is 2002. Thanks, Steve-O, <laughs> always there. Um, yeah, so the FX1 has got the more modern hull design, which 
is really a tip of the hat for, to Hobie, um, Hobie Cat back then for having the foresight to see that that is the way that it was going to go. So well done there. Um, yeah, so if you are talking F-17, the FX-1, brilliant boat. There's quite a few about as well. So it is possible to pick one up for sale. There wasn't a massive amount of them built. I think probably no more than 1,500, maybe 2,000 FX-1s ever built. But no banging noise. Woohoo! Yeah, I made the microphone work. Thanks, guys, for letting us know. <laughs> Russell has gone in with the hashtag no bang. Love it. Mike is great. Oh, this is fantastic news. I now know exactly how to do it. Um, just to let you know, if you're in the same situation, you have to unpair the microphone with the telephone, delete the microphone from the Bluetooth menu, and then find it again, and then it works. There we go. All right. Steve-O, I lent an FX1 cover to a fellow cat sailor. It covers a catapult. I think we're already feeling that the FX1 cover is one of the most versatile covers that you can get. Uh, it covers both the FX1, the Hobie 16, and the catapult. Um, what it won't cover, though, is anything longer than 17 feet long because it will be a bit short. So if you are looking at that, um, I think it's important to know. Okay, Miguel, do you think that it's a good idea to take out the mesh in the winter. Yes, absolutely. If you are not going to be using your boat for a significant amount of time, uh, but you're leaving it outdoors, then you should definitely take the trampoline off. If I'd say you've got to weigh it up, of course, how long it's going to take for you to put it back on. Or if you think maybe there might be the chance of you having a couple of hours to nip out for a quick sail to warrant going out for a quick sail putting the trampoline on um might make it a little bit too juicy time wise so if you are still contemplating going sailing leave the trampoline on but put a cover on the boat if you're not thinking about going sailing but your boat has to live outdoors then yes take the trampoline off also take off all of the ropes also take the mast down um if possible uh, put the mast indoors as well put as much of the boat indoors as you possibly can just because when a boat is exposed to the elements it is going to degrade and um so it is worth um it is worth putting it indoors if you can but um but if you are, if there is a chance that you could go sailing and um, I'm leaving my boat like this with the trampoline and the ropes on just so that if we're doing these videos, I've got something that I can point at like this. Um, but if get some sort of cover to put over the trampoline and the ropes and that will also help a lot. That goes for the, the summer as well, because the UV is an absolute killer for anything on the boat. So have a cover and you will do better. Um, it doesn't have to be a custom made um, or a, a fitted cover or an FX1 cover or any proper cover. You could just get a piece of sheeting um, like tarpauling or something um, as long as it's got some way of attaching some ropes and then tie it on and then off you go. There we go. There we go. Hello, Robin. Good to have you on board. Good to have Florida with us. Um, very nice. Europe sailing. My father once had a Hobie 16. We had many summer trips in it. And what amazing trips they would have been. Um, the Hobie 16 or any catamaran delivering such great fun times for everybody, I'm sure. Um, and some perhaps slightly less fun times, but we won't dwell on those at all at this stage in the game. 
Um, ah, ha, ha, ha. John Bishop is on the line. I used to like the Fox. That was extraordinary. Yeah, if you didn't know the history of the FX1, the FX1 is actually um, was made after the Hobie Fox. Um, so first on this sort of timeline was the Tiger that came out in two, uh, sorry, 1995. Then in 99, Hobie brought out the Fox, which was a 20 foot boat with the same shaped hulls as the FX1. But the Fox came first. The Fox was 20 feet long, 2.6 metres wide. Um, did I say 20 metres? 20 feet long, 2.6 metres wide. And it was for a class that was going to be the International Formula 20 class, which was sort of aimed at people who were too heavy to race F18. Unfortunately, the Formula 20, the International Formula 20 class never really took off. Um, but the Fox is still an absolute beast um, because it's the same length and it's got the same size rig as a tornado, but it's not as wide. And it's got these bad boy hulls that absolutely um, rip through the water like a puppy lapping milk. I tell you, um, rude boy. Exactly. Um and then the FX1 came out, as we've just heard, in 2002 um, as a single-handed version of the Fox. And it was Hobie being comedy geniuses. So FX1 was originally named that because it was a Fox for one person. There you are. Uh, if you didn't know that, you're welcome. If you did know that, then uh, well done for knowing that. But um, there we are. OK, Robin asks, what brand slash model of watch do you wear while sailing? Well, my everyday um, choice. I'm actually going to show you here because uh, I've got it on now because it's my everyday choice is the Timex Ironman Triathlon, which um, pick these up for about 30 euros. And I always put the animal watch strap on um because with this with this style of watch strap if you lose one pin you don't lose the watch that is my thought process on that so this is the watch that i use every day and i do use it if i'm uh going sailing and i don't i'm not so worried about having a gps uh this one doesn't have a gps on it whereas if i do want the gps I'm currently, I've got two watches that I use with the GPS. One is the Timex Global Trainer. I think that's what it's called. Um, which is now discontinued, but you can still find new ones. Um, I've bought two of them on eBay and they come in at about 120 euros. And it's a really easy to use, very simple, but you can customize it Um thing and the battery will last um i don't know a good four hours five hours on one charge so that's decent for any normal length session if you want the gps but for normal situation this one does me fine i've uh recently got the locosis gw60 which is very nice but i'm almost ready to withdraw my recommendation for this piece because mine needs a software update and you can only update the software on uh, what I would call a Windows computer, which I do not own. And I don't know anybody who's got one who is here at the moment. So uh, there we are. That is watch choice uh, today. So uh, glad you could make it for watch choice. Hi, Tim. Good to have you on board. Um, always a pleasure. Hi, Sonka. I, uh, I hope that's how you pronounce your name. I'm 14. But I have a Hobie Max. Nice. Um, the Hobie Max is an excellent starting point in your Hobie sailing journey. And uh, I hope that you're able to get out at the moment. Am um, I guessing that perhaps 
you are from a Scandinavian country. Um, that's just a, a very rough guess. So I'd, I'd assume if you are that your sailing season has finished. Um, but good to have you on board and nice that you've got a boat that you can use, which goes well. Tim asks, any NACRA 5.8s in your area? Unfortunately, um, no. Uh, there's, just trying to think, there are very few NACRAs, I think, in, I'm going to throw it out there and say in Greece, very few NACRAs in Greece. I know there's a few around Athens um, and maybe some around Thessaloniki, but in this neck of the woods, zero NACRAs at all none at all but if um if nacra would like to send us some nacras i uh, could do some reviews that sort of thing go sailing give it some beans get some nice pictures um but nacra will have to supply the boats if that is ever going to happen all right pardon me excuse me uh it's good to stay hydrated oh. all right uh -huh. Stefan. Stefan is um, one of our... Oh, hello, Stefan, by the way. Stefan's one of our most prolific customers here at Wildwind. He's been out here, actually, more times than I have. Uh, so that's 25 years and a lot of times more than once a year. So good to have Stefan on board. Stefan sells a tiger, amongst other things. As the, the most important... There's the stopwatch, cheap one with huge digits. Yeah, he uses the um, Loco Sys as well. Um, but I'd, fit, I'd uh, say Stefan's got a Windows laptop so he can update it on there. Oh, my goodness. I think people are just trying to catch me out with their YouTube user handles. Goonies. Oh, Goonies never say die. I've got it. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, of course. Goonies Never Say Die is in Florida looking to purchase a Hobie 16 1988. That's very specific, I'd suggest. I'd guess that you're not specifically looking for a 1988 16 because that's your favourite year. More so that you've found one um, with a trailer. It'll be my first one. I have sailed Hobie Bravo two times. It's 2,000 US dollars a fair price. Comes with one set of sails, a trolley and a trailer. Um, I'd say that sounds like a pretty good price. As I've said before, if you get a road trailer with the boat, I would value a road, any road trailer, which is roadworthy. I would put a value on that as bottom line, 500 US dollars. So that's $500 worth of good stuff you've got there. If it's then coming with a dolly, a beach dolly, uh, some beach wheels, cat tracks, um, a trolley as well. The trolley starting price, starting value of the trolley, 200. So that's $700 worth of good stuff you've got already there with that 1988. Then if the boat, let's just uh, have another look here. Um, if the boat is in good seaworthy condition, um, and the sails look OK. Perhaps the sails have still got a good bit of colour to them. Then I'd say it's looking good. One thing you should check is just before you pull the trigger on the purchase is just, as I've said before, in buying used boat uh, videos is check the holes for softness. So what very nice shaped sails. Well, I'd say you're almost there. But um, if you do a little bit of CPR on the hulls, so go to your hull and just push down on it. And if it flexes, let's say if it flexes more than a few millimetres, then that is potential for needing a repair. On the deck, on the sides of the hulls, um, look for anything suspicious around where the pylons go into the holes as well. Because um, all of this stuff, if there is anything looking a bit iffy there, that uh, across the whole boat, of course, that is going to add up. Another thing you could look at is underneath 
where the gunnel is. So you might have to turn your head upside down or use a mirror um, and have a look like here where that join is there. Again, all the way around the hulls. Look for anything that looks a bit iffy there. It will, if it's not right, you'll really spot it. And then just think how much is that going to cost to put it right. And of course, the side of the hulls, um, yeah, with your bomb squad style mirror on a stick, have a look underneath the bottom of the hull as well, uh, just to see how that looks. And in fact, all that is looking good. Then I'd say you're good to go. Um, but it sounds like a really, a really good deal. So um, if you want me to check it out, if there's some pictures or a link to a website uh, where the boat is advertised, just uh, email that to me and I'll take a look and let you know what I want because I know that buying a boat is a that's a major purchase and uh, you want to know that you're entering in to this uh, relationship with the boat uh, and the boat is going to serve you well. So there we are. Um, okay, but, um, I've actually had, I better get onto this before going any further with the um the questions that are coming in i had two questions that came in by email earlier and i wanted just to address those now so the first one was we had uh, brian who sails on lake ontario canada on an fx1 we've been talking about fx1s and here we are and he is concerned about putting the kite up when there's a swell running He's worried that he's going to stuff the nose in and then the party's going to be over. Well, if. All right, let's. Uh, and he's sailing the FX1 two up. This is another consideration. But um, all right. Consideration number one is when you're sailing up. So I'm back. All right. So um, FX1. Sorry about that. Um, FX1. Big swell two up. Should you put the kite up if you have if there hasn't been enough wind to double trapeze on the upwind leg, then yes, put the kite up. And it's unlikely that it's going to make you stick the nose in and flip it. Um, what you, you can do with the spinnaker, uh, do check out my sailing with the spinnaker video, of course. But what you can do with the spinnaker is if you put the boat further downwind, it really takes the power off. So if you're sailing with the wind from directly behind you, it's quite unlikely that you're going to get so much um, power that you stick the nose in unless it has been quite windy when you uh, quite well, unless it's quite windy generally. So, yes, put the kite up if it's not so windy. Um, and then as the wind is getting stronger, um, the key is, again, turn the boat more downwind if it's getting a bit much. And the benefit you've got here, uh, Brian, is that you've got two people on the boat. So if you put the spinnaker up, um, so here's the process. Turn the boat downwind so the wind's behind you. Um, put the kite up nice and quick. Sheet it in so it stops flapping. And then very, very, very gently turn the boat towards the wind very gently just until you feel that power come on and then as soon as you feel that power come on that is the angle you want to sail at if when the power comes on you've immediately got this feeling of oh dear this was a bad choice then because you've got a crew on the boat it means that you are able to get the kite down quite quickly and easily um so this is a huge benefit to you. But if you're happy with it, then make sure you're sat in the right place on the boat. So if there is a big swell, perhaps get a bit further back. Um, and then one of the benefits of the FX1 with these hulls is that it will cut through the waves rather than dig in and flip. It will cut in and then pop out nine times out of ten. The thing that will usually flip the boat is the um the actual uh inertia of the crew swinging forwards or flying forwards and then that adding to the boat uh the bows going in and that will flip you over 
So that would be phase two. But again, this steering is absolutely critical. The other thing that's critical is that the crew doesn't have the spinnaker oversheated. That would be a real shame. So if the spinnaker is ever in too tight, this is going to slow the boat down and the boat being slowed down is going to put more pressure in the rig, which means it's more likely to stick the nose in. But don't confuse this with, but if I turn more downwind, I'll slow down. But that's slowing down the right way. Slowing down the wrong way is by oversheating the spinnaker. And that is going to put more load onto the bows there. Really. Okay. But um, yeah, I hope that helps. And then with the waves, just try not, if you can avoid it, when you're coming down a wave, here we go, we're coming down a wave. Here's the next wave. Just to hit the back of the wave straight on. Try to have a bit of angle there and then the boat will come up a lot nicer the other side. Okay, so um, I hope that helps, Brian. Um, let me know. Um, scrolling back. Bit of scrolling back on the cards. Um, I assume that I'm still live. Um, all right, John Bishop uh, down there on the south coast of England doing the Cumberland on the Fox with the kite up in the onshore was the mustard. Two fingers on the tiller. <laughs> not, not half. Oh, yeah, definitely two fingers on the tiller doing the Cumberland downwind with the kite up in the onshore. So when we're talking about the Cumberland, it's a, another term that is used for what used to be called the wild thing in Germany. I believe they called it the flyer, but on Vasiliki Beach, we called it the Cumberland, um, where basically light wind, kite up or no kite, you bring the boat up a bit, get the hull in the air, and then you're trying to dial the boat downwind as much as you can, keeping that hull flying. Um, this can be achieved with um, a bit of uh, tactical crew positioning. Get as much weight on the leeward side as you dare. Take the boat right downwind, two fingers on the tiller. Very nice, happy fox memories there. Um, we used to have two foxes on the beach at Wildwind. Great times. Hi, Sir Robin. Nice to have you on board. As always, ah, the Knack Daddy's here. It's all right. Um, he's uh, the spiritual leader of Nacra Sailing in North Carolina, USA. Um, oh, Greensboro, North Carolina asks, um, please send some 70 plus temperatures and beans level winds for Christmas. Now, you can't ask Santa for, for more than that, can you? I think, and that's the sort of thing that santa should be able to deliver let's have some sweet wind and temperatures that don't make you want to go in straight away all right it's some more bad pronunciation coming up mathan mathan um hello um what do you think about the nacra 15 well this is what i think I think that thing is an absolute bad boy. And if you've got the opportunity to have a go on one, I would absolutely charge in pistols blazing to have a go on one of those bad boys. Because for that, I think this is definitely the highest performance, most exciting looking 15 foot catamaran. Let Let's rule out the, four, the Hobie 14, of course, that is in a different category. But this NACRA 15 looks absolutely amazing. I've never actually seen one with my own eyes, only uh, on the, the paper. Um, but it really looks very good. It is um, a youth training class. And I think the young people don't actually realise how lucky they are because... Back in the day, the youth training class, I think, was um, when I was a youth, there wasn't one. There we are. But um, then there was the Dragoon. That doesn't foil. That doesn't even have dagger boards. Um, then there was, um, in the UK, the Hobie 16 for a bit. But this NACRA 15, absolutely cooking. 
um, I'd say yes. Uh, do check out. I don't know how old you are or how big you are, but do check out what um, the kind of weight, cr ideal crew weight is for the NACRA 15. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. And if you are too heavy for the NACRA 15, but you like that those stylings, then perhaps you should be looking at the NACRA 17 and just start as you mean to go on Olympics all the way. Nice. Mint Boot. Thank you for joining us, Mint Boot. And hello. Have you ever tried a foiling cat? No, I haven't. But I'm absolutely desperate to. That NACRA 15 we were just talking about, that is a cat that foils. Incidentally, if, um, if you're looking for a little bit of spice on your pizza and you are in uh, Europe, there is at the moment, it's probably gone already, there's a full racing foiling bad boy exploder a class up for sale for five thousand euros it's 2016 boat it's on the atlantic coast of france and five thousand euros for that if if i was in france i'd have bought it already but the delivery from greece to france france to greece sorry at the moment is just a non-starter um it hasn't got a mast but that could just be part of the fun sourcing a mast you're sort of building your own boat what a lovely time that's advertised on facebook um it's worth checking out uh because this is the boat that i would most want at the moment is the foiling a class uh thanks for the question hi matthew good to have you on board and we've got dave here uh jenica on a dart 18 yes or no well interesting question i would say depends on what you're doing with your dart 18 if you are racing uh regularly and the other boats that race don't have a jenica on board then don't put the jenica on board but if you're doing a fair amount of recreational sailing cruising if you're covering some decent distance or if you're sailing in light winds quite a lot, and I know on the Dart 18, those downwind legs can feel a little bit dull unless it's windy, then yes, the Jenica on the Dart 18 will add some good performance. But um, I did sail a Dart 18 with a Jenica, and um, what we found as well as, um, obviously, downwind, it adds quite a lot of um, of purchase and boat speed and excitement to the experience but um upwind because the dart 18 is quite a minimalist designed boat all of the equipment for the spinnaker for the jenica it all creates uh proportionally a fair bit of windage because you've got the spinnaker pole the spinnaker chute then um even the spinnaker halyard going up the mast that piece of rope going up the mast on the outside flapping away a little bit if it's trapezing conditions upwind that will create some windage which will slow you down so if you're sailing in a mixed in a in a race and uh nobody else is using a, a jenica on the dart 18 don't well then you'd have the option to take all of the kit off the boat before you go out racing of course but um yeah but for long distance sailing, especially if it's long distance sailing in lighter winds, I'd say putting a Jenica on the boat is a good idea because you'll get to where you're going quicker so you can cover more distance. I would say almost exactly the same things about the Hobie 16 if you're looking for a... Um... Oh, hi, Jake, by the way. Seems just passing through. I'll, <laughs> I'll do a queue jump there. Yeah, nice to have you on board briefly. Yeah, so... Um... But the boat, boats that are designed initially with two sails, like the Hobie 16 Dart 18, um, for the racing in its purest form, that is the mustard. OK, I hope this is helping. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. It's really nice to have you all here. Just scrolling back. OK. Goonies never say die. Very nice shape. 
sales. Can't remember what your previous question was about. Oh, the Hobie 16. Yeah, nice. I think sounds good. And Bill is solid. Hull. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I know Bill as well. He's solid, but um, the Hull is solid. This is sounding like you've pretty much bought that boat. Your mind's made up and it sounds like it's a good idea. So I think you should steam in and get that bad boy. Send us some pictures. Steve-O, uh, there is a Hobie 16 as parts for sale on the south coast of the UK. Now, this is solid gold information because to have uh, a whole boat's worth of parts available, uh, you might need parts. Go take the hat off. Uh, do me hair. Uh, Joyrider hats are for sale, but um, they won't get you before the big day. But um, I can get some in the post tomorrow if anyone wants one. Um, Robin, which part of Florida? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Robin will be able to help you out uh, with a look um, or just a bit of moral support. Uh, or perhaps um, if you're close enough in Florida, what's nicer than going sailing is going sailing when there's another boat out of the same type with somebody on it who knows um, how to operate it. No harnesses and only one set of trapezes. I'd say to start with, that one set of trapezes will be enough for you. Um, and between um, you and whoever you're sailing with, depending on the levels of ability we're talking about, um, you'd be able to just single trapeze either the crew trapezing or the helm trapezing with the crew sat on the boat to start with while you're getting the hang of it. And then it's a very straightforward operation to add the second set of trapeze wires. So, um, yeah, don't don't feel that you have to um, to go and buy another set of trapeze wires immediately and have it set up as a double trapezing boat from the get go. Uh, no need for that. Get it out on the water, stretch your legs, have a go, get used to the boat before then confusing things with trying to helm on the trapeze. Very good idea is to get comfortable on the boat before you start um, before you start going for the uh, helming on the trapeze. And you say no harness, but personally, I wouldn't expect if I was buying a used boat, a harness to come with it because a harness is a very personal thing. It's almost like having a... Um, uh, an item of clothing and it is worth um, getting a new harness because a new harness if you look after it wash it off every time that you use it um, it will last you for a very very long time and it's worth treating yourself to a new harness I think you could probably get a new harness for about $120 something like that check out my Amazon storefront where I've listed quite a few there good styles steve-o steve -o and jake both said thanks for the christmas card from wildwind yeah um i would have to say i wasn't actually involved with that although my name might be on it um but you're welcome even if it was oh there's a picture of an arrow on it okay russell says concerns with the spinnaker stuffing the bow i had an old spinnaker and pitch pulled constantly a new spinnaker will make a huge difference. That's that is interesting to hear. Um, so with an old spinnaker, like with any old sails, they do lose their shape, and you get um, a lot of bagginess in that sail. Where the shape, as it stretches over time, that shape might not be in the part of the sail where you want it, and might actually start forcing the nose in more than you want it to. Whereas a nice, fresh, new or recent crispy spinnaker will have a much better shape, much easier to control. And the shape will actually be what is designed to be used on that boat. So that is a very good tip there from Russell. Um, you can do a lot with the shape, uh, with the tension in the spinnaker halyard. If you pull the spinnaker halyard 
tighter, it has a similar effect to if you're pulling the downhaul on or the jib cunningham. Um, in that it will flatten the front uh, the front part of the sail more and uh, moving the center of effort down and forwards. And um, if you want more shape in the spinnaker, you can loosen the halyard off a little bit and that will make it a lot fuller, which would be better for lighter winds or if you're trying to sail very deep. Um, but you won't have as much choice with an old spinnaker as you will with a new spinnaker, which hasn't stretched so much. Thanks for that, Russell. Ah, Max is here. Thanks for the Christmas card. It's, there's a theme here that everybody who's been to Wildwind is getting a Christmas card. Um, there we are. That's nice customer service. Um, okay. Um, oh, and by the way, on the, the Wildwind news, I am going to be doing one, perhaps two, um, focused, exclusive coaching weeks here at Wildwind in May next year. These coaching weeks will be for Formula 18 and, F um, and FX1 sailing. Um, we'll be running these weeks on Hobie Tigers and FX1s. We'll have five Hobie Tigers, three FX1s. And if you are into that type of boat, so if you sail an F16, an F18, maybe a Hurricane 5.9, Tornado, anything with a spinnaker, double trapeze, centerboards, daggerboards, then it will be a very good week where you could learn a lot of stuff, both light winds and strong wind sailing, and really spending a lot of time getting used to the boat. I've just had a lizard thrown at me, I think. Um, was that a lizard? Oh. Oh, it was a, a fake hand. Um yeah. Um, yeah. So that will be in May. And um, just check it out on the Wild Wind website if you want to get the dates and the prices for that. Um, but in the middle of May, that is when that will be going on with me here at Wild Wind Champagne Conditions and a lot going on there. OK, Tim says just bought a 5.8. That's the NACA, of course. Very limited sailing experience. Thanks for your videos. Ah, oh, Tim's in Australia. Nice. I'm glad that the videos have been helping. Um, it's hearing that the videos have been helping that really gives me the enthusiasm to keep making them. It's nice to know that I'm passing on some of the things that I've learned over the years uh, to so many people and um, saving a lot of people a lot of the not necessarily thrills, but definitely the spills that I went through to get to where I am now. Um, that's good. Okay, we've got Jason in uh, Queensland, New South Wales, who was featured. You may have seen Jason in Sunday's Show Us Your Cat, um, doing some great sailing there. <laughs> All right, he'd just like to clarify, it's two cap sizes. Okay, mate, I did think that after I'd um, put it out there that maybe I had um, stated that Jason had capsized more times than he might have done. So apologies there, Jason. But um, very nice. If you haven't yet seen Sunday's Show Us Your Cat, it is there to be seen. Okay, Steve asks, is your trip to Belgium still on the cards? it is looking like that trip is off the cards. It's a real shame because I would absolutely love to go and see the guys at Goodall Design um, and take a look at this new Acura, which is, or is it Acura? Acura? Acura, which is the new um, F18 from Goodall Design, uh, brand new design, and maybe talk to the guys there about the new uh, design features on that bad boy but um, perhaps we could do something remotely. But with the state of current state of lockdown and uh, who knows, um, unfortunately, my Belgian excursion is on hold. OK, Jason asks, can you clarify the process for depowering on a downwind point of sale? I found that if just downwind of the beam reach, 
it's quick and feels good to steer up onto a beam reach and ease the sail. Or am I just imagining it? Yeah, this is a very good question, actually. Um, there's, there's two ways that you can do this. So if you're sailing on a downwind course, so let's uh, stretch the legs for a second. So when we're talking downwind sailing, we are talking about downwind sailing with two sails or one sail, which our course is defined by looking at the wind indicators on the front. Incidentally, this is old cassette tape, uh, videotape. Uh, I'd say cut to what is that? About ooh, 20 inches um, tied on with a clove hitch. Um, our course downwind wants to be so these wind indicators or whatever wind indicator you're using is flying directly across the boat. So at 90 degrees to the boat, straight across. Because that is the furthest downwind that we can sail without, um, if we sail any further downwind than that, then the boat will be going very slowly and it's not efficient. Any more upwind than that, and we might be going a bit faster, but we won't actually be getting downwind. So that is what we could call optimal um, for our VMG. Um, and then if... Um, if on that kind of course, if we get hit by a big gust of wind, then what we want to do, first thing is we always want to be having a look around on the water when we're sailing downwind. So if I'm sat on the boat like this, and we're going this way, then um, I want to know if there's any gusts coming. So if we're going this way, these gusts are going to be coming from about here. So you may think that the gust would be coming from behind us. But the thing is, we're going forwards. So we're actually going to meet the gusts, which are a bit further up. So always be looking for the gusts. And then as soon as the gust hits, this is what is optimal to do. Like if you're on a race course and on the race course, we'll be trying to get as far downwind as quickly as possible. As soon as the gust hits, we want to just bear away slightly and um, ease a bit of main sheet. So we want to sail further downwind, easing a bit of main sheet. This might feel counterintuitive because you're actually more committed going that way. Whereas, like Jason said, if you head it up, then the power will come off, but it's not as efficient or graceful or if you're trying to sail downwind it's not going to get you to where you want to go as quickly so um sailing along downwind the key to survival on the downwind point of sail is by sailing as fast as possible but focusing on this apparent wind direction and then as soon as the gust hits bear away slightly um, easing a bit of main sheet as you bear away that ease of the main sheet is going to take the pressure off the bows and then once you're on your new course downwind just start to gradually pull the main sheet back in and then continue if you slow down and that gust backs off then you can turn back up onto the wind but your wind indicators on the front will tell you exactly what to do so if they're blowing too far forwards then um, by bringing the boat up towards the wind, that will bring them back to 90 degrees. Now, the other way, the way that Jason's describing, um, if you get hit by a gust to come back upwind, dumping the main sheet, that will save you for sure. Um, and in fact, in a situation where you haven't got the gust early enough and perhaps you've been hit by a gust and immediately the back of the boat's coming out of the water. In that situation, it is better to just jab the boat upwind. That's a jab. Um, going downwind is smooth. Going upwind, quite a sharp turn and ease the main sheet. And then that's going to transfer this pitching force, sending the bows down, into more of a healing force. 
But because you've let the main sheet out, then you shouldn't be getting that healing force so much. So turning the boat upwind is more likely to save you if it is a very sharp gust. But if we're trying to be refined and sailing the boat as efficiently as possible, spot the gust early. As soon as you feel that gust come on, very smoothly turn the boat downwind, easing a bit of sheet as you go. And that is the most efficient. Good. It's a very good question uh, from Jason there. Um, yeah. And to start with, when you're bearing away in the gusts, it is going to feel counterintuitive. But um, just go for it. OK, fun day sailing. Nice to have you on board. Haven't been awake to tune in much since the start time changed. Yeah, sorry about that. But it was getting a bit dark. Um, I'm uh, guessing that you are due west of here quite a few miles. But glad you can make it this time. Knack Daddy says, why so few knackers in Greece? Tons in Europe, Australia, Olympics, everything. The other. Yeah. Um, there, I think there's probably maybe half a dozen Nacra 17s in Greece, which are involved in some level of Olympic campaign or training or something like that. I know Danny and Costas have got at least one which they use for training. They do some very high level training weeks over in Thessaloniki. Um, and um, yeah, but on this side of Greece, really, literally no knackers at all. But there's very few. There's not much of anything. Catamaran sailing is pretty small in Greece and the sailing is much more popular in the uh, double uh, in the monohole Olympic classes. Um, there's a lot of optimists, lasers, 470s. I um, think those would probably be the biggest classes outside of sailing schools like Wild Wind, which uh, have imported a load of uh, other stuff. Ah, Knack Daddy asks. Do you carry an escape tool when you use a harness? Yeah, um, I always carry a knife with me. Um, in the pocket of my buoyancy aid, uh, the three items I'll always have. One is a knife, one is a whistle, and one is a roll of tape. Uh, those are my three, two, three go-to objects in the buoyancy aid pocket. Um, the whistle... Um, I've only just started carrying a whistle, but really it is just as vital, I'd say, as a knife, because the chance of being a man overboard, especially if it's windy or if there are big waves, um, is, you know, there's a significant chance of being a man overboard. And if there are big waves or any waves or if it's windy and you've become separated from your boat, it's very difficult to be spotted um, and shouting, you might be able to be reasonably loud for a short period of time, but you're not going to be able to keep up that level of volume for very long. But a whistle, you could be heard for quite some distance. So I would say everybody should be carrying a whistle. It's my it's my new thing from this year. Uh, carry a whistle. It's a good idea. Um but yeah, I carry a knife as a, an escape tool. Um, I was carrying like a seatbelt cutter with like the hooked bit with the blade in there. So very good for cutting ropes or um, webbing straps, anything like that. Um, and But you can't cut yourself. But then the knife is better because in the event of um, a bit of a drama, with a knife, you can, of course, cut through the trampoline itself should you need to. Oh, just uh, financial news. Bitcoin has just gone beyond $20,000. Um, there you go, in case you wanted to know. Um, Fun Day Sailing says, your videos have convinced me to start looking for a Hobie 16. What a great idea. Um, if you want, you can let us know where it is that you're looking, what your budget is, and I could put a shout out um, to the community to see if anybody knows of a suitable craft up for sale. 
Okay, we have Pierre. Good morning from Quebec, Canada. Minus 33 degrees Celsius. Oh, my goodness. And we're still talking sailing. Crikey, I can't even imagine that. Struth. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice here in Greece. I've got the T-shirt on. Um, must be, I don't know, before the sun went down, getting on for 20 degrees, I reckon. Uh, very nice indeed. Ah, Christian G13. Hello. Nice to have you on board. OK, we are coming up towards the end of this question and answer session. So before we, just make sure before you leave, just hit the thumbs up, the likes button, the likes. Uh, just um, just hit the like button because that's nice. That means other people will get to see this uh, video. Um, so Russell says bridal wire telltiles, telltiles. If you make the tape. Oh, here we go. This is good. If you make the tape just long enough to touch the wire on the other side, your downwind point of sail can be determined by touching the tape to the wire. Now, this is good. We're actually going to have a look at this. I haven't thought of this. I know that we've um, or I've heard, I think I've heard that um, with some single handed boats, they do something similar, which I'll have a look at in a second. But what Russell's saying and which I can simulate here by just sliding this up the wire, make the tape long enough so that it just tickles the wire on the other side when um, that and that will show you that you are at the right angle for downwind sailing with two sails. This is solid gold. Um, if there's one thing you might have learnt today, this is a good one. So uh, I'm going to say do that. You should do that. Um, I did hear on the single-handed boats, uh, useful for the FX1, is you could do the same thing, but put a long telltale about halfway up your forestay or a bit lower, like there, and then for the upwind, you're looking to have that just off the mast sailing upwind because your apparent wind is going to be pretty tight. Um, so that is a really useful way of gauging your upwind sailing angle on a boat which only has one sail. OK, this is this is some good, good stuff today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in because uh, this has been a very productive session i think everybody who's here is getting a lot out of this All right we are coming up to um our um what you call it time limit okay and in fact we're coming towards the end of our questions jason says perfect thanks nice one jason hutchy says good tip there to russell uh, by the way dialed n is russell um if you want to get on first name terms don't know if that's appropriate OK, Fun Day Sailing says um, he is looking around the Vancouver area. So if you're in the Vancouver area and you know of a Hobie 16 for sale, just um, you can put it anywhere on any of the Joyrider TV videos and um, or bet better still, put it in the comments from this video, the comments that go afterwards rather than live. Um, and then Fun Day Sailing will be able to pick that up from there. Okay, Max says, thanks for the offer. Special coaching in May. Let's hope COVID lets me pass the borders. Of course. All right, I've got one more question that has come in. And then after this one, I'm going to clock off. But um, I had another question come in by email from Andre. Um, don't know where Andre was. But he said, "This is, you're not going to see this question coming. Is it possible to change, to adjust your shrouds while you are sailing um all right firstly you may ask why on earth would you want to do that well the scenario when you'd want to do that is possibly you've gone out sailing for a day's racing or a long distance race or um just out sailing out on the water for a long time and you've gone out and the wind's been light and you'd for the light winds maybe you'd set your shrouds let's go to a shroud um for the light winds you set your shrouds to oh, these can be oh, oh yeah 
there we go all right so so maybe for the light winds you like to set your shrouds in the fourth hole from the bottom this is like a a traditional european setting skanky bit of tape lovely um more um and then for heavy winds by putting the shrouds down one hole it means you can sail with the rig slightly tighter um but have the same amount of mast rake which is really going to help you when it's windier but how on earth can you adjust this while you're sailing surely the mast will fall down no no um what you can do is you probably noticed while you're sailing the shr- the shroud on the leeward side goes pretty loose even when you've got the rig seemingly quite tight so all you need to do making sure that you've got enough space to keep sailing on the same tack for a period of time is um send the you can only do this if you've got a crew by the way um but send the crew down to the leeward side try to have the boat sailing consistently but slowly and not with a load of spray on that side of the boat and then the crew should be able to take the pin out move it down a hole put it back in lovely of course the trick shot here is going to be not dropping the pin yeah let's not drop the pin um or at least have some spares on the boat you can get these pins called quick pins which have got like a push rather than having a split ring in the end it's got like a push uh button on the end which you push the button then you can release it move the shroud push it back in done rather than having to fiddle around with a split ring which as we all know split rings are difficult at the best of time so the main difficulty there is going to be putting the split ring back in without dropping it of course once we've done one side then we want to um tack the boat Uh, get it on the other tack, do the other side. And of course, we could release the jib halyard a bit first to allow the mast to come back more. But we just have to be sure that it'd really be a get the split ring out and hold it. And then as quickly as possible, take the pin out, shroud down, pin back in um, so that that pin is out for the shortest period of time possible. There we go go and i think on that note let's call that a day for today um thanks to everybody for tuning in um yeah uh thanks to everybody for tuning in and um and uh yeah there we go thanks for tuning in uh i will be back next week at the same time for um you could call it the Christmas special, but there won't be anything. Yeah, thanks, Hutchie. I thought it was pretty good this week. Um, I like being outside. I think that's the that's the key. Um, yeah, um, there won't be anything special about the Christmas special, apart from the fact it'll be a bit <laughs> nearer to Christmas. Thank you, Jason. Um, really appreciating your choice of dialect there. I think it's been a corker as well. I think it's the clean boat really sets it off. Um yeah and um and then there we go so more show us your cat on uh sunday and that will do for now so thanks and uh see you soon stay safe out there and uh good luck to you all